want to talk today about neurodiversity. Um, really quick, I want to give a disclaimer. What I am saying about neurodiversity is coming from my perspective. Um, a lot of neurodiversity activists um, and advocates share my opinions, but we are all different as well. And when I use the term we, I use a provisional we. I think that as Unitarians, we understand the value of diversity. A healthy organization, like a healthy society, includes people who come from various backgrounds and who represent diversity in gender, race, sexuality, religion, culture, and socioeconomic class. What we often forget to include in this list is diversity and disability. It may seem strange to hear me say that we need diversity and disability. You might think that if a person is disabled, we should try to cure them. So the ideal outcome is to eliminate disability. In a sense, that's true. However, there are many disabled people for whom the search for a cure is meaningless. For many of us, the idea of a cure is not only impossible, but insulting. This is a particularly popular belief among the neurodiversity community. We have different minds, yes, but we like them, and we wouldn't change ourselves even if we could. To explain neurodiversity, I need to explain a little bit about the broader problem of disability, specifically the distinction between the medical model and the social model. The medical model is the one that you all know, probably the only one that you all know, which is problematic for a number of reasons. It's not your fault, though. No one really teaches a social model, despite the fact that it's been in existence for decades. I don't believe this to be any coincidence. The medical model is a convenient one for today's capitalist society because it alleviates social responsibility. Under the medical model, people are disabled because of some flaw or defect they have. A blind man is disabled because he lacks eyesight. A wheelchair user is disabled because she lacks the reliable use of her legs. The social model, however, was a response to the medical model, which was developed by disabled people themselves. Under the social model, a person's impairments are value neutral, and their disability is the fault of society for the barriers it creates. Going back to the examples of the blind man and the wheelchair user, they both experience accessibility issues if a building doesn't label its rooms in braille or doesn't have ramps and elevators. The problem isn't that these individuals have some inherent defect. It's that we structure our society to suit able bodies. And when we neglect to take into account the needs of people with impairments, then we actively disable them. Barriers don't have to be physical, though. One of the very common and arguably more destructive types of barriers are attitudinal ones. The blind man faces attitudinal barriers when someone complains about the presence of a service dog. The wheelchair user faces attitudinal barriers when she is ridiculed for exercising her ability to stand for brief periods of time. In sum, the social model recognizes disability as a social problem rather than an individual one. The neurodiversity movement was born out of this social model, and it focuses specifically on neurological disability. It was developed by the autistic community to combat the idea that their brains are somehow inferior. Since its conception, though, it spread to include other neuro-minorities, like those diagnosed with mental illnesses or those with learning disabilities. Central to the neurodiversity philosophy is the idea that neurological conditions are a result of normal variation in the human genome. There really is no such thing as a normal brain, and there is no default to which other brains should be compared. Regardless, the social construction of the normal brain persists, allowing for the professional diagnosis of mental illnesses and disorders. While these aren't distinctly definable categories, they are helpful in identifying broad patterns of thought and behaviors. Not all of us accept the mental illness perspective, though, so we prefer to call them neurotypes. We define the most common type of brain, what might otherwise be considered a normal brain, as a neurotypical one. Brains which don't conform to this norm are sometimes called neuroatypical, neurodivergent, or neuro-minorities. So are neuro-minorities really oppressed? 
Well, historically, the most common way to justify the mistreatment of any oppressed group was to call them disabled. African Americans were often considered to have less developed minds. Certainly the fact that most slaves were illiterate had nothing to do with the fact that they were discouraged from reading. Women who had the gall to hold opinions could be labeled hysterical. Homosexuality was, until very recently, considered a mental illness, and transgender people <coughs> are still struggling to demedicalize gender dysphoria. Fortunately, many were able to dispel these claims, but they weren't able to escape unaffected. Just think of the common claims that women are emotional while men are logical, or that homosexuality is unnatural, implying that queerness results from a deviation of the normal mind. You didn't even have to be part of a group in order to be controlled by the many labels of madness. If you were espousing ideas which were dangerous to the ruling majority, they would only have to diagnose you and your voice would lose authority. Even as people have demedicalized different aspects of human experience, bettering their own situations, they have inadvertently worsened ours. While others move away from the idea that their minds are different, they are, in essence, saying we're not like them. It's easy to forget this past, especially when it's absent from most historical narratives and from classroom lectures. Just last week, in my intro to psychology class, my professor talked about experimentation on humans and the ethics involved. Obviously, I can't just drill into your heads and destroy parts of your brains to see how it affects you, she said. Except she didn't talk about how people used to do just that. And it didn't just happen in some distant, undeveloped country either. It happened in places we would traditionally consider civilized, like in Europe and the United States. I believe this should not only show the scope of the abuse, but also call into question our traditional perspective of civilized societies. If you were considered insane, you ran a good chance of having doctors open up your brain and experiment on you. Psychosurgery was practiced as early as the late 1800s, and just a few decades later, Portuguese neuroscientist Antonio Egas Moniz developed the infamous lobotomy, for which he was awarded a Nobel Prize. In 1946, Walter Freeman, an American physician, developed the transorbital lobotomy, in which a person's brain was accessed through the eye sockets, shortening the procedure to no more than 10 minutes, and consequently increasing the prevalence of lobotomies. In the United States alone, Around 50,000 people were lobotomized. Lobotomies, unfortunately, weren't the extent of the abuses to which people with neurological differences were subjected. Institutionalization used to be much more common, but the psychiatric hospitals, which held masses of people, weren't too pleasant either. A 1946 Life article characterized the US psychiatric hospital system as resembling little more than concentration camps. In fact, it was common for people in these situations to be shackled to the walls, making apparent that they were really nothing other than prisoners. While you may think that cruel practices like lobotomies and chaining patients to walls and beds are things of the past, they haven't disappeared. Psychosurgery is still practiced today, though to a much lesser degree, and only with consent. Thank goodness. Mental health workers still physically restrain neurodivergent people, whether by strapping them to a bed or by the use of their physical body. The latter is commonly used by parents and family members as well as a way to quell neuro minorities whenever they act out. Electroshock therapy might also sound like another remnant of a cruel but distant past, but it's also still practiced. Now known as electroconvulsive therapy, this standard psychiatric treatment involves using electricity to induce seizures. One of the most common abuses, however, is something that's become so normalized that you undoubtedly know about it, but probably haven't questioned it, the use of psychiatric drugs. Psychotropic drugs have become the first line treatment whenever someone is diagnosed with a disorder. Sometimes these medications improve people's mental health, but often they don't. The side effects can be worse than the drugs themselves, and there are times when the medications do the opposite of what they were intended to do. Even in a best case scenario, medication necessarily alters your mind, making you other than yourself. In theory, none of these things are bad if their treatment's given with informed consent. 
The problem is, they often aren't, and that it's entirely legal. <coughs> Children, for instance, might act in a way that defies societal and parental values of how a person should behave, and could be given drugs to alter their behavior. While the use of psychiatric drugs may be justifiable to treat young children in some cases, this point is debatable. It's legal to forcefully medicate minors until they reach age 18, way beyond the point when they gain the capability of consent. It's also legal to court-order treatment for certain individuals. For the most part, this is restricted to those in psychiatric institutions. It may seem like that vastly limits the reach of forced treatment, but it's not as difficult to forcefully institutionalize as you might think. If you have a mental health diagnosis, simply saying you want to kill yourself or kill another person is enough to get you institutionalized, even if you say it in jest. I've read accounts where people have expressed relief when a family member has said the words because that meant that they were allowed legally to institutionalize. It's getting even easier to institutionalize people as well, mostly thanks to the myth that neurodivergent people are more likely to commit violent crime. This is simply not represented in statistics. In fact, neurodivergent people are more likely to be victims of violent crime than they are to be perpetrators of it. I think that uh, this is a myth that is perpetuated despite the fact that statistics go against it, but it's one that um, is rather convenient for society, I believe, and it's one that others people to the extent to which only someone who's insane could commit something wrong, meaning that you could not possibly do that because you're not insane. So if a violent crime is committed, you can diagnose the person yourself if the person doesn't already have a diagnosis by a psychologist or by the media. And that way, you are attributing a moral value to neurodivergence, something that I think is pretty dangerous to do. Still, there are benefits to being neurodivergent. Many companies are targeting autistic employees because of their adherence to structure and attention to detail. Tech companies, in particular, are reaching out to the autistic community more and more. Autistics are known to be socially awkward, which can cost them employment opportunities when they fail in interviews. Employers are starting to see the value of different minds, though, and can consider the trade-off to be well worth it. Like autistics, obsessive compulsives are known to exhibit repetitive behavior and may feel a greater sense of ambition than most people, often leading to good work ethic and culminating in thoroughness. They're also often able to see patterns better than most people. Bipolar individuals are also known to exhibit uh, special abilities. A lot of the time, they have a higher degree of creativity, like schizophrenics and people diagnosed with ADHD. These things are very hard to pinpoint, though, as everyone's mind is different. And while some people might uh, have greater degrees of creativity with their neurotype, these are correlations rather than something that's directly caused. But when you think about it, we do have this sort of romanticization um, with madness and creativity and art. There are plenty of famous people who have been neurodivergent. Virginia Woolf was a very famous author who was also bipolar. John Nash was a Nobel laureate in economics. He was schizophrenic. Howard Hughes and Nikola Tesla were both obsessive compulsive. I don't think I'd even have to begin to list the number of people, famous people, who have experienced a depression. Though these people exhibit traits, which are beneficial though, we still face the problem of oppression. And I think that that comes to a large degree because it's embedded in our very own language. It's part of the problem when I said what I was talking about with the violent crime. In violent crime, something is bad, something is evil, it's also insane. When you call Hitler insane, you're comparing me to Hitler. 
And I just think that that's something we should start to recognize. Words like crazy, words like insane, those are ableist terms, and they're terms that harm us. They're terms that perpetuate these ideas that we are less than other people, that we are bad people, that we have something wrong with us. It's a way of othering to a point in which we are no longer people. And when we try to speak out against our oppression, it's taken as a symptom of our disease. We're silenced in that way. So yes, in a way, it's true that we'd be better to eliminate disability. But eliminating disability doesn't necessarily mean eliminating impairments. For many of us, getting rid of our disability would only be possible by receiving reasonable accommodation to offset the burden society places on us, and by changing the attitudes which perpetuate our oppression. I hope that one day people will start to see differences in neurotypes, as well as differences in disability in general, as very normal, varying degrees, um, and that they will begin to see them just as they see things like race, gender, sexuality. They will begin to recognize the importance of diversity on a neurological scale, as well as on these other scales. And we will be valued for ourselves rather than devalued, and rather than succeeding despite disability. <laughs>